Welcome to this Wisel Lexel VBA tutorial. In this video, we're going to explain how to highlight the minimum and maximum values in a chart. We'll start by explaining the basic code required to create a simple column chart, and then show you how you can loop through the series of data contained within the chart. We'll explain how to use worksheet functions to calculate the minimum and maximum values of each series, and then show you how you can loop through the array of values, comparing each value in a series with the minimum and maximum values. We'll explain how to apply formatting to the columns in the chart, and then explain how you can apply the same techniques to work with line charts and markers in lines. So let's get started. Let's start by creating some basic sample data. In a blank workbook, I'm going to create a list of month names. I'll add a column heading called month at the top of column A, and then type in the name of the first month, January. When I've done that, I can click and drag the autofill handle all the way down to fill in the complete sequence of month names. What I'd like to do then is create some random values next to each month name. So I'm going to create a column called value one, and then next to the word January, I'm going to type in a function equals rand between. I can then choose a minimum and a maximum value that I want to generate. I'll go for a number between 1 and 20. And then when I enter that formula, I can double click the autofill handle to fill it down to the same height as the column next to it. If you don't like the set of random numbers you've got, you can press F9 to recalculate them so you get a different set. And then whenever you want to stop the recalculation from happening when you do other things like type into a cell, for instance, or remove values from a cell, you can highlight the set of numbers copy them, and then simply paste special values. Now let's add some code to create a basic chart. We can open the Visual Basic Editor, insert a new module into the project, and let's create a subroutine called highlight min max. We can then declare a variable, I'll call mine C as chart. And I'd like to set that variable to reference uh, a new chart that we'll create. So set C equals this workbook dot charts dot add. I can then set the source data for that chart by saying C dot set source data. And I want to make this reference the range of cells in the entire table on sheet one in the workbook. So several ways I can do that. Here's a nice simple one. I can say this workbook dot worksheets sheet one dot range a1 and then I want to reference the entire table that range a1 belongs to so current region will reference that entire block of cells so I have misspelt current there missed the t there we go so having done that I just want to finally set the chart type so I'm going to say c dot chart type equals and to begin with let's have a basic excel column clustered chart having done all that let's just give the code a quick test make sure we get a new chart, we can have a look back in the workbook, and there we go, there's our basic chart ready for formatting. Next, I'd like to get access to the array of values contained in the series of the chart. Currently, our chart contains just one single data series, but I'd like to set up the code to make sure that it can handle any number of series that the chart might contain in the future. Let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor and start by creating a new variable. I'm going to call mine S as series. We can then write a for each loop that will process the series collection of the chart. So we can say for each S in C dot series collection. A couple of blank lines before we close that loop by saying next S. For each series that we process, I'd like to capture its array of values. So to do that, we'll use another variable. I'm going to call mine values array. Uh, with a lowercase a there, values array, and I'm not going to assign a type to it. That will happen automatically when we add the line of code, which says values array equals s dot values. Just to demonstrate what happens here, if we view the locals window and then step through the code by using the F8 key, we should see that when we get to the point where we've initialized our code, values array is initialized as empty, but when we get to the point that we assign the values array to the values array variable, we can see that we get 12 values populating this array now, indexed from 1 to 12. You can see what those values are by expanding the values array item in the locals window, and you're welcome to compare these values against those in the worksheet, just to make sure that you're getting the correct values stored. 
Now I'd like to calculate both the maximum and minimum values from the range of values stored in the array. Let's stop debugging the code at this point by hitting reset and I'll close down the locals window just to give myself a bit more space. Now we can declare a couple of extra variables to hold the min and max values from the array. Let's start by declaring max val as double. Currently the chart only uses whole numbers so we could use integer or long for this but in the future we can't guarantee that the chart won't use decimal values so we'll use double to give ourselves that flexibility. On the same line I'm going to declare min val as a double while I'm here and then within the for each loop after we've captured the array of values we're going to use a worksheet function to calculate the max and then the min from that array. So we're going to say max val equals worksheet function dot max. You may well be familiar with this function from working in Excel normally. We can happily pass an array into the max function. So I'm going to pass in values array. We can then do exactly the same thing to get the min val using the min function from the worksheet function property. So worksheet function dot min, open some parentheses and pass in the values array. To check that we're getting the correct values, we can write a simple debug.print statement. So let's say debug.print maxval, comma, minval. And then if we were to run the subroutine at this point and view the immediate window, we should see that we get both the maximum and the minimum values from the range of cells. So let's have a quick look in the list of cells in the worksheet. So 20 is the maximum value we've generated and one is the minimum. We can reassure ourselves that this is working properly by adjusting these numbers. So if we went down to 19 for January and then upped it to two for August, if we go back to the code and then run it again, we should see a different set of numbers this time. So we are definitely calculating the correct values for each series. Now that we've captured the max and min values, we need to compare those against each individual value in the entire values array. To do that, we're going to loop over the values array using a for next loop. This means we'll need to have some kind of counter variable. So I'm going to declare n as long. And then rather than just debug.print maxval and minval, we're going to have another loop. I'm going to say for n equals. Looping over an array, we've done this in several previous videos. Uh, one way to do it is to state the minimum and then maximum uh, index of elements in the array. So we know that our array contains 12 values. However, we can't always guarantee that that will be the case. So it's better practice and provides us with more flexibility if we use a function called L bound to calculate the index number of the lowest bound element of the array. So we can say L bound values array to U bound values array, which calculates the highest numbered element in the array. If I give myself a couple of blank lines and then say next n, that will process each individual value in the values array. We can now compare each value in the array against the min and max values that we captured earlier. We'll do this using simple if statements. I would like to check if values array n is equal to max val then. What I'd like to do is format the data point whose index number is equal to the value of n. To do that, I can refer to the points collection of the series. So I can say s.points and then in some parentheses, pass in the value of n to refer to the point corresponding to the value that I'm looking at. I then want to access the format properties of that point. This is quite a long winded sequence of properties to reference. If you know them, you're welcome to go with, I believe, format.fill.forcolor.rgb equals RGB lime. But that's quite a lot of guesswork if you uh, if you don't know that so well, um, especially if you're from the UK as well and you, you're forced to spell color without the U. I frequently type in color with a U even to this day, no matter how many years of experience I have. So rather than trying to guess these properties, what it might be worth doing is having a separate variable to hold each point that we reference. So let's have another variable dim p as point. And for each item that we encounter in the for next loop, I would like to say set p equals s dot 
points n. This means that after we've finished our if statement, or within the if statement in fact, we can say if the value that we're looking at in the array is equal to the max value, then we want to set the formatting properties of p, and you can see now we get access to the IntelliSense. So it's much easier to see what we're doing. So p.format.fill.4color.rgb equals, and I'm going to go with RGB lime, so it'll be a bright shade of green if it's the max val. While we're here, nice and simply, we can say else if, not end if, sorry, else if values array n equals minval, then p.format.fill.4color.rgb equals rgb red. I probably should have just copied and pasted that. Anyway, let's have an end if statement just to wrap that up. And then we can tidy up a tiny little bit and give the whole thing a quick test. So if I run the entire subroutine from start to finish, have a look at the chart I've got created, I can clearly see that the max value is in green and the min value is in red. Just to demonstrate that this also works for charts with multiple series, let's head back to sheet one and then let's add in a couple of extra columns. I'm going to highlight the, uh, the cell containing value one and then drag that across to the right to create value two and three. And then we can enter another formula in column C equals rand between. And we can then, let's see, what can we go for? Rand between, let's go with the same range, one comma 20. I can then enter that formula and I can fill it across to the right and then double click to fill it downwards. At that point, I can copy all of those values and then paste special values to stop them from recalculating from this point onwards. If we simply then return to the Visual Basic Editor and run the entire subroutine again, when we look at the new chart that we've created, we should be able to see that each individual series highlights its highest and lowest values. So even if those highest and lowest values are different between the different series, we get the correct value highlighted for each one. It's not particularly pretty. I appreciate using the various, the, the sort of the default colored bars, but the interesting thing is you can highlight the max and min values. All the other formatting will be entirely up to you. As one final thing to mention, this is a useful technique to apply to line charts rather than simple column charts. If I switch back to the Visual Basic Editor and then alter the type of chart I'm creating here by saying c.chart type equals Excel line instead, and then run the subroutine again, I'll generate a line chart with three series, but none of the points seem to be highlighted. This is simply because by default, the line chart that I've created doesn't have any markers associated with it. So what I would need to do in order to make this system work for a line chart would be in the Visual Basic Editor. For each series that we encounter, we should apply marker styles to the series. So within the for each loop, which loops through the series collection, we can say s.markerStyle, amongst other things as well, of course, we can say marker style, marker size, etc. But if we say marker style to begin with, equals, and then we can choose any of the standard marker styles. I'll go with a simple circle. This means that we also need to alter the property that we're formatting. So for each point, we don't want to format the fill for color RGB. All we need to do here is refer to the, if I get to the right place, there we go, P dot marker foreground color. Likewise, for the red dots, we'll have P dot marker foreground color. If I do this, there's all, we're almost there. If I run this one and have a quick look at the results, hopefully you can see the green circled points and the red circled points. The slight issue is that the foreground color only applies the sort of outline color around the, yeah, the point. If I want the entire point to be green and red, what we can do is do the same thing to the background color. So I can say p dot marker background color equals RGB lime. And then also p dot marker background color equals RGB red. One final test, if I run that one one more time, we can hopefully see some slightly more neatly formatted dots on the chart. Okay. 
I hope you found some of the ideas in that video useful. Thanks for watching. See you next time.